welcome to Roundup Sunday here at North Valley Baptist Church. Let's stand together and grab your hymnals, please. Hymn number 13, Guide Me All, the Great Jehovah, Pilgrim Through This Barren Land. Sunday this morning. It's so great to have you in church this morning, and we're looking forward to a wonderful day in the Lord's house. We want to welcome our guests as well. We've got a number of guests here today, and I believe Pastor Sealing and his wife and children are here from Washington. We're so glad. Sailing, I'm so sorry. Pastor Sailing, I haven't had a chance to meet you. I just was told you're here. We're so glad to have you with us this morning. We welcome our online guests as well. Let's commit this service to the Lord in prayer and ask God to move in our midst. Father, we are so grateful to be here today, and I pray that you would allow us to stay focused on thy word and on thee this morning, and may we not be distracted by the festivities of this day. And we thank you for your love and goodness to us. We thank you for the cross of Calvary. I pray, Lord, you draw the lost to salvation. And God, we ask that you would move in our midst. We're hungry for that bread of heaven we've just sung about to fill us. Lord, is our prayer, for we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you for standing.
you so much. 426, please. 426 in your hymnals. Tempted and tried, we're off, made to wander, but farther along, we'll know all about it. 426, sing with us on the first. Tempted and tried, we're Let's turn over to page 424. As you turn there, I want to welcome you to church today, up in the balconies, all those sections. God bless you, good crowd, the lower floor. And our guests are watching online. We have the other property packed over there today with the C division, the Spanish. We have the B division here has come in now. And children's church is going on. It's wonderful being in God's house. Tonight, this morning, you'll hear Brother Cooper preach. Tonight, I'm going to uh, get after it. I'll have a voice by tonight, I promise you. But I'm so thankful you're here. The ushers are going to give a visitor packet to every visitor. And if you fill out a card and just place it in the offering plate, we'd appreciate it. There's visitors everywhere. We're glad and grateful that you're here. Ushers, please come. This song before us. I remember as a young boy, we'd sing it a lot in church in my brother-in-law's dad's church, not far from here. It was written in 1953. That was the year we came to this area. You know, my twin sister's here, Jill. I was telling someone last week, she was so far ahead of me. She uh, walked at eight months. I walked at 13 months. We were coming to California. My folks were gonna move to Whittier, California. They chose to stop by and see my uncle over here in San Carlos, and my sister got spinal meningitis. 
She had to, had to learn how to speak again and how to walk. And God kept us here. You know, there's nothing wrong with we've been in Whittier, California. But God wanted us in Santa Clara. You know, God, God, God governs all this. I don't understand all that's going on in this country. I just, it's, I can't fathom it how parents are called domestic terrorists now. I can't comprehend it. But I know that God knows everything. Sometimes I feel discouraged. I can hear it. I can sing, hear us singing this in church when we were little kids. Sing it together, page 50, page number 424. Brother Martinez, you get ready to bail me out, okay? Sing together. Sometimes I
the angry crowd cried out to crucify. They nailed him to a rugged cross and left him there to die. They gambled for the royal robe he wore, not knowing they had crucified my Lord. He bore the sin and shame of all mankind, and as he hung there dying, I was on his mind. His sacrifice and love some don't appreciate, but I would like to stand and set the record straight. That's my God. more than fairy tale. He's just a myth or legend, and his presence, it's not real. His word is not correct politically. They curse and mock his name defiantly. But time has never changed the changeless one. Their lies cannot disprove the existence of his son. Though some may be content to just sit by, I for one must stand and testify. are coming through the house at the bulletin raise your hand if you need one quickly i do want to remind you just a few announcements of course service tonight at six o'clock we're in the book of zechariah this evening if you want to take a look at it this afternoon 14 chapters the workers clinic training will be at 505 up in the golden state baptist college chapel and this is week four. We look forward to that. Teachers, there's a new time just five minutes earlier. Instead of 525, it's 520 downstairs. We look forward to seeing you right on time. I want to remind you that this coming Wednesday is the Lord's table. The theme on that evening is all about the cross. And we look forward to that. Last day today of the fall, uh, fall uh, brick campaign, foundational brick campaign. The ushers do have a card, or you can go online if you'd like to participate in that. A brick out here is $500, and we look forward to getting them another section up here over the next few months. On Tuesday, in our church, our, our, with our church, we have two funerals at the same time, and I want to let you know about them. Well, they're an hour apart, but they're about an hour away from one another, so. I want to take them in order here. The first one that passed away was uh, Sister Travis, and her service will be at the Chapel of the Chimes in Hayward. That's 32992 Mission Boulevard. 
There's a viewing Monday from 4 to 7. The service is at 12 noon and graveside to follow. And uh, we have several of our folks that are late to rest there in Hayward, so we look forward to that service on uh, Tuesday. Brother Paul Aldama, who sat right down here, I appreciate Brother Paul. I see his mom, I just saw you there. Oh, I love your son. And Brother Paul uh, passed away suddenly last Sunday, and his service is going to be at 11 a.m., <clears throat> pardon me, at Lima Family Memorial Chapel here in San Jose, 710 Willow Street. And uh, these are two great members of our church and great families. And so we uh, want you to pray for them. I know you have been. Ushers, come. I'd like to talk to you quite a bit about the offering, but we're out of time, so I guess the Holy Spirit of God will have to talk to us. I appreciate your faithfulness. Visitors, we're so glad you're here. I have enthusiasm in my heart, but you can't hear it in my voice right now. But I appreciate you being here so very much. Well, I ask a Bert, Brother Bertram if you'll come and lead us in prayer for the offering today at this time. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your goodness to us. Thank you for all the many blessings that you have bestowed upon us. Now is our opportunity to give back out of that which you have blessed us with, and I pray that we might do so willingly, we might do so joyfully, and we might do so obediently. Bless each gift and each giver. Use it to the furtherance of your work, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Oh. 
Well, I don't have to try to hide my accent today. I can just talk like normal. Take your Bible. Go to Psalm 107, please. Psalm 107 is good to be in church on Sunday morning. Thank you for being here. And we're looking forward to what the Lord's going to do. And uh, appreciate everybody participating and dressing up. I did have a couple Pharisees in my class that didn't. And they sat back there and snickered at me while I was standing in front of them. But everybody else participated. Thank you for doing that. I got an excuse to carry my pocket knife today. I was excited about that. I had a guy a few, uh, a few years ago. He's passed away here recently, but when Donald Trump got elected, he got me a commemorative Donald Trump Make America Great Again pocket knife. And I thought about this. That's pretty good size. Uh, Brother Poussin always, well, I don't want to say it on, but anyway, he's packing whenever we go out. Maybe I should carry this when we go soul winning now. That'll tick them off before we cut them. That'll be a blessing. All right, Psalm 107. We're going to read verse number two this morning. I want God to speak to our heart here in Psalm 107, verse number two. If you're able to stand with me, why don't you stand? It's just one verse of scripture, and we'll get right into the thought for today. Psalm 107, verse number two. Look what the Bible says. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so whom he hath redeemed from the hand of the enemy. If you study this chapter, the entirety of it, basically it's a chapter of God delivering his people. Not just delivering, but over and over again, delivering them continually. They were hungry and he fed them. They were in distress and he delivered them. They were in a battle and he fought for them just over and over again. God came through and did what God does. He delivered his people. It's sort of summed up, though, in the statement of verse number 2 where the psalmist writes it and said, if you've been delivered, if you've been brought out, if you've lost something and had it restored to you, if you've been redeemed, you ought to tell it. You ought to talk about it. You ought to testify of it. You ought to say so. Isn't it amazing what Christians will waste their time talking about? I mean, they'll run their mouth about a lot of things. But the Bible says if you're going to talk about something, testify of something, brag on something, that will be the fact that you've been redeemed. Amen. For a little while this morning, I want to preach on this thought. Let me just say so for a second. Let me just say so for a second. Lord, I pray that you'd help us this morning. I need your power, and I pray for liberty here. I pray that you'd meet with us. If, no, if someone's here who's never been saved, they don't know you as their Savior, I pray they'd be born again today. For Christians, I pray that you'd help us to be quick to say so about our redemption in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. Redemption is one of the most foundational concepts of the Bible. Also, redemption is a fundamental doctrine of Christianity. It's a bedrock truth. It's a big truth. And if you're saved, it's a blessed truth. I was studying and read, one man said, redemption is the spring from which all the rivers of grace flow. Job was in the midst of a trial, and he made that famous statement about redemption. He said, For I know that my Redeemer liveth, and that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. Now, in regards to our salvation, the concept of redemption is comprehensive. By that, I mean it, it covers the entire spectrum of every aspect of what goes into God saving the soul of a sinner. In fact, if you study your Bible, you could really sum up the Bible in just two words, and those two words could be ruin and redemption. If you take it in from Genesis to Revelation, the message of the Scripture is the message of redemption. Just survey it, and you'll find that the Bible always runs from chaos to order. It runs from darkness to light. It runs from sin to salvation. It runs from bondage to to liberty. It runs from law to grace. It is redemption through and through. In fact, redemption would be that golden thread that holds the Bible together. For the Christian, we can sing the hymn, and it can be our personal testimony that says, Ere since by faith I saw the stream, his flowing wounds supply redeeming love has been my theme and shall be till I die. Redemption's a truth that takes shape in the very first book of the Bible. In the book of Genesis, God reveals to Abraham that there would be a day when God's people would be taken into bondage. But God would not leave them in bondage. God would bring them out. God would redeem them out of that bondage. In Exodus 6.6 6 is the first mention of that word redeem. There the Bible said, God speaking, I will rid you out of their bondage and I'll redeem you with a stretched out arm and with great judgments. 
I was studying and I looked it up in the Webster's 1828 Dictionary and he defined redeem or redemption as the act of procuring the deliverance of persons or things from the possession and power of captors by the payment of an equivalent ransom as the redemption of prisoners taken in war, deliverance from bondage or distress. Now, in Exodus and Leviticus, God laid out the Old Testament plan of redemption. The process of redemption is provided for several individuals. For example, the process of redemption was provided for those sold into slavery. It was provided for those who had an unsettled debt that they could not pay. It was provided for those who had been killed by the hand of another. And it was provided for those who had been widowed and had lost their spouse. So the act of the Redeemer was to get back everything that was lost by the one in need of redemption. Let me say it again. The act of the Redeemer was to get back everything that was lost by the one in need of redemption. So in slavery, the Redeemer could get back the liberty that had been lost by the one that had been enslaved. In debt, the Redeemer could get back the loss of that one who had everything taken away. In the case of murder, that Redeemer could avenge the life of the one who had been murdered. In the case of the widow, that Redeemer could restore that family bond that had been broken by death. I think we can say it like this. Redemption was a wonderful thing. In the Old Testament, it gave hope. It offered mercy and it extended grace. And I think it was probably worth saying something about. If you had been a slave that had been set free, you'd probably talk about it. If you'd had a debt and somebody had paid your debt, you'd probably want to talk about that. If somebody had been murdered and somebody avenged the death of your loved one, you'd probably want to brag about that. If you'd been widowed and then somebody put their name on your life, and got you back in the family, you'd probably want to talk about that. Redemption repaid, redemption restored, redemption rewarded, and redemption would recompense. It was redemption that got Isaac off the altar. It was redemption that got Israel out of Egypt. It was redemption that got Ruth back in the family. It was redemption that took Naomi from empty to being blessed beyond measure. You better believe Isaac would have talked about it. I believe Ruth probably talked about it. I would say Naomi was quick to talk about it. God would redeem individuals. God would redeem nations. God would redeem assets. And in the Old Testament, it was God's promise and God's program for getting back that which was lost. Can I say it like this? It was a great thing in the Old Testament, but it can't compare to the act of redemption that we find in the New Testament. It was a wonderful truth back then, but it's a hundred times greater for you and I living today. Here in Psalm 107, we find a song about the faithfulness of God to deliver his people. In this song, we don't just have a record of God delivering his people, singular, but God continually, repeatedly delivering his people. Now, if you're today looking for a reason to complain about God, I'll say it like this. You'll not find any ground to grumble about God when it comes to his ability to deliver his people. Because you study it out and you find over and over again, again and again, God is faithful to deliver his people. God always shows up. God always shows out. God always shows off. God always does what God does and delivers his people. You read the psalm. They were in a battle and God fought for them. They fell and God picked them back up. They were hungry and God fed them. They were in distress and God delivered them. Over and over he was, he is, and yet abideth faithful to deliver his people. In the second verse of the chapter we find the theme summed up just in that statement. I like to call this a sentence sermon. By that I mean we don't have to have other scriptures to even support the content of this scripture. It stands all by itself. Now, in this verse, the songwriter lays out the responsibility and what ought to be the response of an individual that has been delivered by the hand of God. In verse number two, look at what it says. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he hath redeemed from the hand of the enemy. 
Now, I like the word redemption, and I like the phrase say so, because basically the thought is this. If you've been brought out or bought back, if you've been delivered, then it's probably worth talking about. That phrase say so means to testify. That word say so means to rejoice over it. That word say so means you ought to get happy about it. In modern terms, you might say it means to say amen. It means to say tell it. It means to say say on. It's like the psalmist is saying this. If you you're reading this song and you fit the description of someone who is in a battle or someone who is in a storm or someone who is destitute or someone who is afflicted and God showed up and brought you out of whatever that dilemma was, you ought to clear off some real estate, call time out and shout over the fact that you have been redeemed. I think I'd say it like this. If you were granted victory over an adversary, he's saying, say so. If you were a slave and now you're free, you ought to say so. If you were hungry and now you're filled, you ought to say so. If you're afflicted and now you've been healed, you ought to say so. If you were down and he brought you out, then you ought to say so. If God did for you what you couldn't do for yourself, you ought to take some time, tell the world, and say so about your redemption. Redemptions for those who couldn't do it on their own. Redemptions for those who couldn't pay it. Redemptions for those who couldn't unlock the key, or rather the lock that held them in bondage. Redemption was for those who couldn't secure their own liberty. And the psalmist is a reminder that you ought to shout the fact that if God did something for you that you couldn't do for yourself. He's saying if you're brought out of bondage, you ought to tell the world God brought you out of bondage. If you were in need and God met it, you ought to tell the world God met your need. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. I think about that song, Redeemed, how I love to proclaim it. I said earlier, redemption's a wonderful thing in the Old Testament, but I'll say it again, it's much better in the New Testament. I'm glad redemption didn't stop with Malachi and it didn't end with Egypt and it didn't run out with Ruth, but I'm glad every act of redemption in the Old Testament is just a type that we find fulfilled by one great act in the New Testament. It was good in the Old, but it's a hundred times greater in the New. Now, if the Old Testament Israelite had reason to say so over their redemption, I think probably a New Testament born-again child of God has reason to say so today over our redemption. I think of my blessed Redeemer. I, sing, I think of Him all the day long. I sing because I cannot be silent. His love is the theme of my song. I am redeemed by love divine. Glory, glory. Christ is mine. So today, if you've been saved, if you've been brought out, if you've been delivered, if you were bought, if you paid your ransom, you ought not be quick to be silent, but you'll be quick to shout over the fact that you've been redeemed. The price has been paid and you've been delivered, just like in Psalm 107. We had an adversary, but he gave us the victory. We were in a battle, but he gave us the victory. We were down, but he got us up. We were out, but he got us in, and we have a redemption. Like Naomi, we were broken. Like Ruth, we were cast away. Like Israel, we were slaves. Like Isaac, we were headed for judgment. Like Esau, we'd forfeited our inheritance, but thank God for our redemption. Not might not be a rich person, but if you're redeemed, you got, you got something to say about it. You might not be renowned, but if you're redeemed, you got to say something about it. We ought to be able to say it. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. It's amazing what saved people will waste their time talking about. They don't hesitate or hold their tongue to say so about most things in life. They'll say so about their kids. They'll say so about their sports. They'll say so about their job. They'll say so about their hobby. They'll say so about their church. They'll say so about their pastor. They'll say so about the weather. They'll say so about the restaurant. They'll say so about politics. They'll say so about gas prices. They'll say so about COVID. Even saved people. I mean, you listen to their testimony, and it sounds more like the bad side effects of some miracle drug on daytime television than it does someone who's saved on their way to heaven. They talk about their arthritis and gingivitis and bursitis and all these other itises. But when's the last time somebody stood up and said, I just want to say it's good to be saved. I'm glad I'm redeemed. I'm glad I'm not going to hell. I just want to say so for a second. Second, let me just talk about redemption quickly and we through. Three, three aspects of redemption. Number one, I have been redeemed. I don't work for my salvation. I don't have to secure my salvation. Tis done. The great transaction's done. I am my Lord, Lord's and he is mine. 
First Corinthians 1 30 but of him you are in Christ Jesus who of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption Romans 3 24 being justified freely by his grace to the redemption that is in Christ Jesus Galatians 3 13 Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law being made a curse for us for it is written curse it is everyone that hangeth on a tree Colossians 1 14 in whom we have it's a current possession whom we have redemption through his blood even the forgiveness of sins here's probably the greatest verse first Peter 1 18 for as much as you know that you're not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received from the tradition of your fathers but with the precious blood of Christ creation was a good work but salvation is the greater work creation cost God his breath salvation cost God his blood you studied out from Genesis to the millennial kingdom blood is the price for access to God you and I as Christians today when we were lost in sin we fit every type of the Old Testament individual that needed redemption we were out of the family we were in bondage we had a debt we could not pay but Jesus Christ fulfills every Old Testament type of the Old Testament Redeemer and he came and got us out of our bondage and he paid our debt and he set us free he shed his blood in Exodus 12 there's blood everywhere to get them out of Egypt but can I say better blood was shed for us when Jesus died on Calvary blood that goes deeper than the stain of sin and the only reason I'm not going to hell today and the only reason you'll not go to hell one day is because the blood was shed to pay your sin debt in mine I owed a debt but his blood paid it in full I lost my inheritance but his blood got it back I was a slave but his blood set me free I I was out of the family but his blood put me back in Christ walked in thank God he showed up and he did what I couldn't do he became my Boaz to my Ruth a stranger yet I found grace and he redeemed me I've been redeemed far greater than the Red Sea worse than Pharaoh more difficult than Hagar a slave Jesus stepped in and took the condemnation off my life let me say so for a second I've been redeemed from all iniquity I've been redeemed from the curse of the law. I've been redeemed from bondage. I've been redeemed from the penalty and power of sin. I've been redeemed from evil and trouble and distress and adversity and destruction and death. Redemption justified me and adopted me and accepted me. And now I'm God's purchased possession. I've been redeemed. If you're here today and have any hope for heaven, you'll not get there outside of the fact redemption through the blood of Jesus Christ. Number one, I've been redeemed. But number two, what about this? I am redeeming. I am redeeming. The Bible says in Colossians 4, 5, walk in wisdom toward them that are without redeeming the time. Every moment I have now, I should live for the glory of God because he purchased my life. It was his life for mine, so it ought to be my life for him. Now, you have a decision on how you deposit your time. You can put it in salary or self or sports or success. You can put it in your spouse, whatever. Not, those things aren't necessarily sinful unless you do that before the Savior. Because your life is not yours. You've been bought with a price. We don't know how much time we have left, but I think we all agree we don't have a lot. We all have an appointment with death, and we also are uh, uh, anticipating the rapture. Both those things will be quickly approaching. And with whatever time we have left, we ought to use it to the glory of God. I am redeemed, but I ought to be redeeming the time. And now I'm going to get to the third point because that's really where I want to preach today and stop. I'll be redeemed. I've been redeemed. I am redeeming, that's progressive, but I'll be redeemed. One day there's a redemption coming, and it comes to us via the resurrection and the rapture. In spite of death and in spite of decay and in spite of decades of being buried in the dirt, there's a day coming when the soul that has been redeemed at salvation will receive a new redemption body at the resurrection. You see, that doesn't make sense to science. We're not talking science, we're talking God. Paul stood before Agrippa and he said, Why should it be thought a thing incredible with you that God should raise the dead? Jesus said, He that believeth in me shall never die. I'll say it like this. God is simply in the resurrection business. 
God is in the business of making dead things live again. Jesus is the perfect example of that, for our Savior didn't stay dead. He came out of the grave on the third day. It's impossible, I understand that, but think about it like this. You know the illustration, the Bible uses it in 1 Corinthians, but growing up we always had a garden, and we would sow seeds in the ground, and then we would bury that seed under a blanket of brown earth. You know, we'd just bury it down there, but that seed would germinate unseen to the eye. The sun would warm the earth, the water would saturate the soil, and in due season, that seed would come up through the ground, but it didn't come up the same body that was sown. It was far different. Can I say, the same thing is going to happen in the life of the believer. It's impossible to science. It doesn't make sense to the skeptic. We can't really even comprehend it. But one day, the same voice that called Lazarus up out of his tomb will cry out across this world, and all the dead in Christ will rise, and you and I that are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and I'll have a new body. Praise the Lord. Lord, I'll have a new life. It's just as weird to us as a little acorn producing a mighty oak tree. But can I say God can do it and God's going to do it. I mean, all those lost at sea, all those burned in the flames, all those devoured by beasts, those dead for generations, and those with unsettled soil yet upon their grave are going to come out and be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye and the fullness of our redemption will be realized on resurrection morning. So that means this, don't sorrow as though it's hopeless. And don't say goodbye like it's forever. And don't stare at the grave of your loved one like it's never going to open because one day redemption's coming. We live with eternal life pent up in a temporal body. But one of these days, it'll be paired with an eternal glorified body. Psalm 17, 15 said, As for me, I'll behold thy face in righteousness. I shall be satisfied when I wake with thy likeness. Ephesians 4.30, and grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed unto the day of redemption. We're waiting for this. Ephesians 1.14, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession. The Bible talks about Job said, For I know that my Redeemer liveth and shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. And though after my skin worms destroy the body, this body yet in my flesh, shall I see God. Take your Bible, go with me to 1 Corinthians. Let's read a few verses. We've got enough time to read these quickly before we, we close. In 1 Corinthians chapter number 15, we find this passage that talks about our glorified body. Now, I don't know when he's coming, but I know he is coming. And when he comes, I know this, my old body's treaded out for a new one. Look at what it says in verse number 35. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. I've been legally secured by adoption, but I'm waiting for the full enacting of that adoption on that resurrection day. Look what it says. But some man will say, how are the dead raised up, and with what body do they come? Thou fool, that which thou sowest is not quickened, except it die. And that which thou sowest, thou sowest not that body that shall be, but bare grain. It may chance of wheat or of some other grain, but God giveth it a body as it hath pleased him. And to every seed his own body. All flesh is not the same flesh, but there is one kind of flesh of men, another flesh of beasts, another of fishes, and another of birds. There are also celestial bodies and bodies terrestrial, but the glory of the celestial is one, and the glory of the terrestrial is another. There is one glory of the sun, another glory of the moon, and another glory of the stars. For one star differeth from another star in glory. So also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption, but it's raised in incorruption. It's sown in dishonor. It's raised in glory. It's sown in weakness. It's raised, this sounds pretty good, it's raised in power. It's sown a natural body. It's raised a spiritual body. There's a natural body and there's a spiritual body. Verse 51, behold I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed for this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality then uh, so when this corruptible shall put on incorruption and this mortal shall have put on immortality then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written death is swallowed up in victory O death where is thy sting O grave where is thy victory the hymn writer sweet hour prayer sit it right this robe of flesh I'll drop and rise to seize the ever 
lasting prize. And one of these days, I will be redeemed. Right now, I am redeemed. But I love you. I thank God I've been saved by the blood of Christ. But the fullness of that redemption will be realized when the trump of God sounds and the clouds roll back like a scroll and the Lord descends with a shout and the dead in Christ rise. Thank God it's not goodbye at the grave. It's not forever at the funeral home. If they've died in the Lord, we'll see him again at the rapture and the resurrection. His appearing is glorious. His body is glorious. And our body will be glorified with him when we meet him in the air. A glorified body. Let me say so. That means a glorified body. No sin. It's been glorified. No cancer or disease. It's glorified. No hard of hearing. No dim eyesight. No weak limbs. No foggy mind. No wrinkles. No scars. No stain of sin. A new body made just like Jesus Christ. I think about it when Christ left the tomb. He left his grave clothes there. He didn't need them anymore. And when we leave this world, everything that's affected our body because of sin will leave it all behind. No mark of death, no mark of decay on this body. This body is a body of death. I'm dying right now. As we breathe in it, we're, we're all headed to the same place. But that body is a body of life. This is a body of pain. But that body is going to be a body of peace. This is a body of corruption. That will be a body of incorruption. This is a mortal body, but that's an immortal body. This body's fashioned like the first Adam, but that body's fashioned unto the second Adam. One of these days, if the rapture doesn't take, this body's going to fall back to the dust. But thank God a new body's going to rise up out of it. I thought about that especially in these days. We've had several people in the last three weeks from our church pass away. There'll be funerals this week, and there was one a couple weeks ago, you all did. When we look there at that unsettled soil, we ought not sorrow as them who have no hope. Because just like the farmer who's planting seed, we expect fruit to come forth. I remember preaching my grandparents' funerals on the hillside of a, in West Virginia at a graveyard. We went there and did the graveside service, and they're buried next to each other. And me and another preacher did, and that country preacher said, we're, we're planting them here in this garden of resurrection. He said, in God's due season, his roses will bloom. <laughs> like country preacher talk I'm glad I've been redeemed I don't have to fear death I don't have to fear the devil amen I don't have to worry about hell been bought with a price now I know we're quick to say so about a lot of stuff and there's a lot of stuff that's fun to talk about but there's nothing so so special or so important or so needed to hear in our day as your redemption you have been redeemed we got to be redeeming and one of these days we'll be redeemed it's coming if you're today and you're not sure you're saved, you need to be saved. Because here's the thing that we don't know is when death's going to come to you. We don't know. You might be living your last day on earth right now. You could die before you get to your car. I hope not, but you could. And if you've never accepted Christ as your Savior, if you don't have that nailed down, you need to get it nailed down today. Hell is too hot and eternity is too long to just gamble with your soul. And if you've been redeemed, when's the last time you said so? When was the last time you told somebody about it? I'm going to pray the altar is going to be open, but here's what I said. Just be real still for a minute. There might be one or more here that need to be saved, and I don't want to distract them. Would you just bow your heads with me for a moment, close your eyes, and just let me give an invitation real quick. Let me ask you this. Don't be moving around too much, but really just, just, just tune in to God, and if God's speaking to your heart, please just obey Him. Maybe you're here this morning, and you'd say, Brother Cooper, I'm here. And they say, I believe in God, but I don't know for sure I'm ready to meet Him. Because if I die today, I'm not 100% settled on it. I don't know for sure that I'm saved. So I'm concerned about that. And I want you to pray for me. And now listen, God knows your heart, but would you let me pray for you? Would you raise your hand and say, please pray for me. I want to be honest with you. God knows, but pray for me. Lift it up. Hold it up so I can see it, please. You say, I'm not sure I'm saved. I see that back there. All right, some back here. Thank you for your honesty there in the back. I appreciate that. Right here is one in the middle. Thank you for that. And you, thank you, sir. I appreciate that. And over here is one. Thank you over here. Appreciate that. Anybody else? You're not the only one. Several, five or six people have raised their hand. Anybody else say, pray for me. I'm not sure in my heart that I'm ready to meet God. I'm concerned for my soul. Up and right back down. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to pray to him. And if you raise your hand, you should come to this altar. We have people that can show you from a Bible how to be saved. Christians, you should come and pray for, uh, pray for those who aren't saved. Also, maybe it's been a long time since you've said so. 
You want to come just say thank you to Jesus for redemption. I'm going to pray the altar be open. If you raise your hand, would you go ahead and step out now and come forward? Lord, I pray that you bless this invitation today. I pray that you'd let these come that need to be saved. I pray they'd get saved today. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand at our feet if you would. Folks are already coming. Would you step out? If you raised your hand a minute ago, would you please step out and come? If you're over here, 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 up the top, if you raise your hand, would you step out and come? Good, come on. If you raise your hand, just come on. That's good right here. Yeah, good job. Come on. Anybody else say come? What about it? Would you step out if you raise your hand? Thank you, sir. Amen. Brother Pearson right here. If you raised your hand a minute ago and said, I'm not sure about eternity, would you let somebody show you from a Bible how to be saved? You're not sure. Heaven's your home. What about it? If you're in the back and raise your hand, you can get out. You just ask folks next to you to let you out. They'll let you out. If you need to come, you come. If you lifted up your hand and said, I'm not sure about eternity, would you come, please? We have pastors down here that want to show you from a Bible how to make it sure before you leave today. Would you let us help you with that? Are you sure? If this was your last day on earth, are you ready to meet God? What about that? You say, I'm not sure I'm ready. Why don't you just get it settled? Would you come while the piano plays and people are praying here? You're, you won't feel odd about it. We'll rejoice with you. That's why we're here. That's the most important thing that we do as a church. Altars open. Folks are coming. Would you come? There's still room for you here. Maybe you have somebody on your heart today that's not saved. Would you step out and pray for them? Maybe it's a son or a daughter. Maybe it's a wife, your husband, a neighbor, a co-worker. But somebody's on your heart right now. And you're worried about their soul, concerned for them. Would you come pray for them? Ask God to deal with them. This is a good opportunity to get saved while the Spirit of God is working. Folks are still praying. We'll close here in just a moment, but folks are still praying and being dealt with from the Bible about salvation. If you need to pray with somebody, let us know, please. I was in church my entire life, 21 years old, in church, lost. In the right atmosphere, but wasn't saved. Maybe you've been around it, but, but you're not sure you're ready to meet God. If that's you, would you come? Just a moment, I'm going to close. Don't let your opportunity pass by. God's dealing with you. Lord, thank you for the privilege to be in church today. Thank you for the gospel. Thank you for dying for our sin, for paying the price to set us free. God, many more people raised their hand than what came. I pray that you please give them mercy and grace to hear the gospel another, another time to have another opportunity to get saved. Maybe if they're still on this property, I pray that somebody maybe would catch them or they'd catch somebody and they'd get saved before they leave. I pray for those being dealt with from the Bible that you give them understanding and that they would be born again today. Thank you for the privilege again to be here. I pray that you bless our church. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. What a marvelous message today. And I'm so thankful for Pastor Cooper. I'm thankful for the people of God. You listen so carefully. Aren't you glad you've been redeemed? I'm so grateful that God saved me. I can remember as a boy lying and uh, being wrong and uh, disrespectful at times, I'm certain. But God saw me saw beyond my sin. He saved me. And uh, I'm so grateful for these being led to Christ today and uh, thankful that you're here. Tonight we're at 6 o'clock. We look forward to a great service tonight. We'll have a full choir tonight, full orchestra tonight. A lot of folks are out working in different ministries this hour. And we'll have a great, great crowd here tonight. We look forward to seeing you here. Tonight uh, afterwards, um, someone has purchased that everybody can get a cup of coffee or hot chocolate but it's still going to cost you a buck uh, the, the brother luke and ron they're doing it for their bucket so everything is for that we look forward to that this evening there's three photo booths out here if you want the lights on you can take it at nighttime 
but there's a fall one, there's a western one, and there's a Christmas one out by the, what I call the stadium where we preach for so long when you drove in the cars and we're in the tents. And so we look forward to, uh, if you want to use that, someone will be there pick, taking pictures, uh, I believe, after the service this morning also, as well as before the service tonight. It's good to be in God's house. You know, this right here, in every city, every county is the answer for America right now. We'll pack our stadiums. Oh, what to God we'd pack our churches with people again. And I say that as a compliment. You're here and an amazing crowd. We'll baptize in a few moments, and we'll let you be dismissed before that. They're getting ready. Baptism shows that we believe Jesus died on the cross, and he was buried, and he rose again, identifying the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ. I'd like several of the pastors, if you'll go back to the door today and to be there to shake hands. I always like to go there, but I think I'll let them be there today. And uh, Brother Tony and Ruth, we're glad you're here. Uh, it's their son, Paul, that passed away. And Kaylee, right there, you're uh, Paul's daughter. We're so glad you and your son, Jax, are here today as well. I uh, want you to know that Brother and Mrs. Green have been saved, and they're going to follow the Lord as believers baptism. We're still dealing with several more down here. I wonder if you could just greet that person there. I think other preachers all out there. There's pastors at the door. And uh, 6 o'clock tonight, God bless you. You are dismissed. Duh.